Hello, welcome back to Oral Surgery Journal Club. I have a interesting and classic article to discuss today. This article comes from Michael Zide and John Kent, dates back to 1983, and it's titled, What are the Indications for Open Reduction of Mandibular Condyle Fractures? This is a fairly famous paper, and from this paper we, we, we learn of four absolute indications for opening up condyle fractures. Now again, these these four indications are fairly classic and I'm sure you've heard them referenced. If not, I'm glad you're joining us today because you're going to learn what are the four absolute indications according to Michael Zide and John Kent. Michael Zide and John Kent were both former directors at LSU and they're fairly uh, well known in the oral surgery literature um, and John Kent is still involved with LSU and Michael Zide is in Texas and they have a resident review course and I'm sure you guys have seen their names in the literature. All right, so let's give you some background prior to 1983 I'd say from the 50s until that to, until the 80s it was fairly common to close reduce condyle fractures like the vast majority or so and even to this day I'd say most condyle fractures are still treated closed but the argument for opening them has grown maybe a slight bit now the basis for close reducing is well established it's based on both of these papers and you may have heard these these papers reference the Lions Club in 1947 and McLean who was a, sur uh, a plastic surgeon in 1952 did big case series about close reduction and showed fairly good results and ever since then since the 50s that's the way they've been treated and the rationale is well supported and the reasons for close reducing it is firstly like I just said we know there's good results secondly there's a little concern about injury to the facial nerve. Anytime you have to access the TMJ, you have to go near the facial nerve, you could injure the facial nerve. Third, it's technically difficult to do the surgery, and maybe that gives some apprehension to some certain surgeons unfamiliar with the surgery. And lastly, open reduction will cause a cosmetic, a, a very not cosmetic scar. Okay, so for those reasons, close reduction has prevailed. However, we also know that although most patients do really well with close reduction, there are a subset of patients who will have some malocclusion postoperatively, and those patients, if we can only identify which ones, would benefit from open reduction. So the, now the, the, the trick is trying to identify which patients would best be served by open reduction. And so according to Zide and Kent, and their institution, they had 300 mandible fractures, about a third of which were condylar fractures, so about 100 fractures every year. And based on that experience, they came up with the following four indications of patients who absolutely are indicated for open reduction. And here are the four classic indications. Number one, displacement into the middle cranial fossa. Now this is extremely rare, and I have a case report that will show you a nice picture, so as you could appreciate, here is the condyle, it is displaced up into the middle cranial fossa into the brain and I'm sure you could readily appreciate that this would best be served by openly reducing getting that condylar head out of the middle cranial fossa if you just put the patient in MMF that would still leave this obvious problem okay that would be the first indication displacement into the middle cranial fossa indication number two the impossibility of obtaining adequate occlusion. So that means you put arch bars on, you try and you sedate the patient or paralyze the patient, and you try to manipulate the teeth and try to get a good occlusion. And for whatever reason, despite all your efforts, you cannot get an occlusion. That would be the second indication for open reduction. Third indication, lateral extracapsular displacement of the condyle. Now, what do we mean by that? We mean, because let me just clarify, sometimes when you get displaced, displacement of the condyle you can get like a medial overlap or a lateral overlap but still the condylar head is typically still often in the glenoid fossa we're not talking about that we're talking about where the condylar head itself is displaced so here would be and again very rare but here's a case report and a nice picture that shows in this picture the condylar head is displaced out of the glenoid fossa that would be the third indication and the fourth indication is invasion by a foreign body something like a bullet a gunshot a ballistic some foreign body that could eventually cause infection or fibrosis and for that reason it should be debrided and then in the in while you're doing the debridement and you have open access you might as well do an open reduction so for those four indications you could do an open reduction and the thrust of these four taken in a whole is in very rare and limited circumstances patients would be benefit from open reduction. And 
if you were to stop reading the paper there, and typically that's where people stop, especially when they reference these four, you get the sense that, it, like I said, it's very rare to open or reduce it. The vast majority of patients with, are perfectly adequately treated with closed reduction, and only in these 1% of the time should these be opened. But actually, you're doing a disservice, and I think you're misrepresenting uh, Zide and Kent and what they were going for. And we're going to continue reading the article because the truth is, there, those are the absolute indications, but then they continue on and they talk about relevant indications and then they talk about some case reports. And as you read on, you see that despite the, in addition to those very few limited indications, there actually is quite a bit more. So the, the, the box gets a little bit bigger, the latitude for the surgeons get a little bit bigger, and the indications actually get a little more expansile. So what are some of the relative indications? The relative indications would be uh, times when you have, when it has to do with the occlusion. So we're going to get into a couple examples. One is bilateral consular fractures and the patient's edentulous and you can't splint them. The alveolar ridge is atrophic. All right, so you can appreciate there, you're not really going to be able to do a good closed reduction. Next, um, the patient cannot tolerate splinting for medical reasons. And he gives you a couple examples. A patient with a seizure disorder, psychiatric illness, alcoholics, patients with refractory behavior and mental retardation or neurologic injury. So in all those subset of patients, they cannot tolerate prolonged MMF. Now exactly how long is MMF for condylar fractures is debated. I'd say classically from Walker, it's somewhere between one, two or three weeks. And maybe more modernly, some authors are advocating going straight to elastics. But the point is patients like that cannot tolerate prolonged MMF nor from a medical standpoint, it's not healthy and therefore Patients like that may be best served or should be considered for open reduction. Um, other indications would be con bilateral fractures associated with mid-face fractures or patients with poor occlusion. So the four category four is all patients like orthognathic patients, patients retronathic, open bite, periodontal problems, lack of posterior support, loss of multiple teeth. And all these patients, you have a very poor occlusion. And the, the thrust is the thrust of it is if you if you're going to rely on MMF and they have a poor occlusion, you're not going to get a stable result. Um, and then lastly, they also talk about orthodontics, which we're going to get to in the case report. When patients are undergoing active ortho, the teeth are mobile and they're not unstable, so you can't you can't fixate that for, for a prolonged period of time, or else you'll get occlusal disturbances. All right, um, so I think. We're going to move into the surgery and some of the case reports next, but I think just reading that, you get a little bit better sense of what Kent and Zide were going for. So in addition to the absolute indications, then there is a case-by-case -case basis that each surgeon has to make, and I guess this is a little bit of a gray area. It's not absolutely indicated, but it should be taken into account. Is the, is the occlusion stable? Is there any other factors associated with? Will the patient be able to tolerate MMF? So that may give the surgeon a, a, a degree more of latitude to open it in certain circumstances circumstances. All right. Now, talking about the surgical technique. Now, this is obviously, you know, we don't read papers from 1983 to learn how to do the surgery. We would look at maybe a modern article or textbook, but the point is what I want to appreciate is is how they did it and you can maybe deduce that they may that may have influenced that indication. So, when as you read through the surgery and I'm going to I'm going to summarize it for you. You know, they did the surgery like we did the surgery today we did sub, via some mandibular, retromandibular approach or preauricular approach, sometimes combined. But a lot, of, a lot of the technique where he talks about he gets bogged down with is the anatomy of the nerve and where to find the nerve different landmarks. And you could appreciate that that was a concern, injuring the nerve. And something which they didn't have at their leisure back in 1983, which we all have, and we take advantage of quite regularly, and at least in my institution, is a nerve stimulator. And with monitoring of the nerve, we made the surgery so much safer for the patient and more predictable and easier for the surgeon. And I think that's one bit that has changed from 1983. And the second bit is when they talk about after exposure, then they have to talk about a fixation. So they talk about various methods of stabilization that have been advocated, things like um, wiring, K-wire, wiring via drill guide, other methods of plating, pinning, bone plating. So bone plating was not very common in this time period. It was just starting to take, it was, the transition was probably right around here in 1983 where bone plates were becoming more and more common. 
and we were leaving wires. And I think that's another factor to take into account when we're looking at how they did the surgery back in 1983. All right. Now, the last thing is the Zidane can they report a couple of cases and each case actually serves to highlight a different one of the indications mentioned earlier and how in that patient specific application it was appropriate to openly reduce them so I'm gonna go through this pretty fast case number one the patient was sedated they applied arch bars they realized they couldn't manipulate the mandible into proper occlusion they applied elastics they sent the patient home saw him a week later and still even with elastic traction they still had a poor occlusion they said all right at that point the patient needed to be openly reduced all right point uh, case number two they talk about this patient so this patient had a poor he had a class 2 malocclusion he was retronathic in addition he was also had multiple other fractures and a symphysis fracture and the symphysis fracture was wired so again the um, a lot of the, a lot of the case reports they were wiring the patients they weren't really using plates it was just this is really at the turning point for when plates started to come around so again they're wiring comminuted you have a symphysis fracture you can and bilateral you can appreciate why one would benefit why one would think that the patient would benefit better from an open reduction in the anatomic fixation all right case number three there's a bullet so that's obvious that's a foreign body that's a clear indication case number four this patient was a heavy ethanol use so he's an alcoholic so he may not have tolerated it plus they also mentioned he had a lot of other fractures so again same idea case number five this patient is a little bit of an exception he was just medically unhealthy and case number six they actually talk about the where they did MMF and they kind of wish they did open reduction. So they said they had a 25 year old, he had bilateral condor fractures, he had active ortho, he was treated with MMF for six weeks, which is already very long for condor fractures. Like I mentioned earlier, typically it's one to three weeks, but whatever. And then when they cut him out after six weeks, he had severe retronathia and an open bite. And they mentioned how you have to treat patients who are under active ortho, you have to treat their teeth as if they're mobile, and true occlusal stability cannot be possible unless you skeletally fixate the splint. So I think that's important already at that point. So nowadays that would be, I guess, equivalent to us doing a hybrid arch bar where we're using IMF screws. But using Eric arch bars and trying to get occlusal stabilities with the teeth obviously is going to cause the teeth to extrude and then you'll cause some occlusal disturbances. All right. So that's it for the cases. That's it for the, 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 the indications, the absolute and the relative. And I just want to leave you with this because I, well, I hope you guys appreciated that article. I know I, when I read this inside, I got a different sense of it because often when it's quoted, I believe it's quoted and maybe inappropriately or misrepresenting what the, the thrust of Michael Zide and John Kent were going for. Because you get a sense from the four absolute indications that there's only very few reserved and limited true indications for open and reducing it. And often people will use that and say, look, anything besides those extremely rare cases, like it went up into the brain or it's out of the glenoid fossa or there's a bullet, except for those very rare circumstances, well, then patients would benefit from closed reduction. But I don't think that's what they were going for, right? Uh, and certainly in 1983, when the surgery wasn't very easy, they were opening up. They mentioned that they had 100 fractures and 20 out of the 100, so one-fifth of their fractures they opened. So by no means were they reserving open reduction for the very rare and limited cases. And I would argue that in today's day and age, um, now that the surgery is easier and we have plates and it's more reliable and predictable and easier and safer, maybe we should consider opening up more presuming it's safer, uh, presuming there's a benefit. So that leads me to this other paper, which I'm just going to give you a quick preview. We're going to talk about it next time, hopefully, whereas some of the newer studies give you additional indications besides for the four classic. And they talk about, they look at different factors, things like the degree of displacement and the, sh the vertical ramus shortening, right? When you have when the, the segments overlap, then the ramus height is shortened. And when the ramus height is shortened, you get a premature, con a premature contact. And by incorporating those two other factors, the degree of displacement and the vertical ramus shortening, you can come up with additional indications. And we'll get into this paper later, but the, the, the bottom line from this paper is that patients, they looked at open versus closed, and they used those indications, and they saw across the board patients open had better outcomes in terms of MIO was better, in terms of lateral excursions, in terms of protrusion, and in, in terms of pain score.
So for all four of those parameters, patients actually did fare a bit better when they did open versus closed. But anyway, we'll get into that next time. I hope you guys enjoyed this today. Let me know your comments. What are your? What, how do you guys treat condyle fractures? Are you pretty conservative and you're close reducing most patients? How are you seeing any occlusal disturbances down the road? Are you seeing any patients that you kind of wish you opened? Or are you guys opening a, bit, a fair bit of these fractures? All right, guys, have a good day, and I'll see you next time.